start more or less on time. Uh, this is the first uh, session, uh, more let's say ordinary session, uh, where the focus uh, uh, will be on the applicant states, uh, mostly Sweden, Norway, and Netherlands. So the Denmark, we heard quite a lot last uh, yesterday evening. Uh, so um, we will have the presentation of the two papers first, and then uh, hopefully, or uh, I will try to make sure that we have some time for questions or comments. Um, I will repeat in public what I said privately to the speakers that they should try to stick to the time limit, 20 minutes for each paper. So, um, let me present the speakers of the first paper, uh, who are uh, Hanne Hartvet Wick. <coughs> she is an associate professor of international history at the University of Oslo. Uh, her focus uh, is on history of human rights, indigenous rights, and uh, development aid. And uh, together is Kag and Alexander Östberg. Uh, who holds uh, a master's degree in history from the University of Oslo. Uh, he has worked on the online history of Norway, and uh, he is a research assistant for several history projects. So, you can. Might sleep, I'm ready for a very long day. <laughs> I can assure you the Greeks know how to party because in my hotel there has been parties on every floor and I've been moving up and down <laughs> during the night. So if you can excuse me, but a little bit tired. This uh, the talk today uh, was mainly uh, about the later period, so the the legacy or the significance of the Greek case for what came after. And we had, given that there was another paper on the decision to file the complaint, we had decided not to spend much time on it in our presentation, but now, since that paper is no longer here, we will nevertheless try to cover a bit on the Greek case, and I will open with some remarks on it. You are probably aware that there are already three uh, studies on each of the three Scandinavian states and the Greek case as it became known. So building on this, we have been interested in particular in the public um, debate, the public pressure. All the Scandinavian uh, governments reported that there is so much public pressure we need to do something. So what was this public pressure about? The coup was immediately condemned by all government, as we heard yesterday. And the foreign ministers had met in the birthday party of Norwegian prime minister. He turned 70 years old. And this was uh, a meeting organized because he was. they were already supposed to meet for that birthday. The Scandinavian foreign minister discussed for the first time how to react to the coup. The Norwe this Norwegian and the, no, the Nordic countries, they coordinate foreign policies uh, on a regular basis uh, and have done so for, for a very long time. And on the highest level, the, the Nordic ministers of foreign affairs and, of course, the Nordic prime ministers, they meet regularly. But they also meet on a lower level. So there's organized meetings uh, between the Nordic uh, foreign ministries on a regular basis. 
And these sources, of course, give a very good insight into how the discussions between them have emerged. In the spring of 67, this must be understood against the, the time before, as we learned yesterday, about how all three governments had increasingly gained a more vocal stance on issues of ideological and moral character in international politics, starting in the late 50s, early 60s, with uh, an early uh, support for um, anti-colonial sentiments at the UN, uh, anti-racist uh, positions against the, um, the South African apartheid system. So they were early more vocal than others, and especially more vocal than they had been themselves. So this was beginning um, to be a treat or a trait of uh, Scandinavian foreign policies that they were uh, outspoken. <coughs> Of course, during the 60s, Sweden in particular gained much more room of maneuver as a non-allied state. They were opening up st structurally for a more active foreign policy engagement that the Swedish uh, exploited, chose to exploit. So when the coup happened, the question was, so what should we do more specifically? And the possibility of using the European Human Rights Framework was raised in national contexts even before this meeting of the Norwegian, no, the Nordic uh, Prime Ministers, the Foreign Ministers. They all agreed that they did not want to move alone. Of course, moving together meant that they shared any negative re repercussions if uh, they were criticizing more powerful states or taking a controversial point of view. They also agreed when it came to the European uh, option that the complaints procedure was complicated and time consuming and that they risked spending a lot of energy on something that was not efficient. So throughout the summer they did not take a position on whether to apply or submit an application or not. In Norway, there was a huge debate over the sale of um, military equipment and boats to Greece, which almost broke down the Norwegian government. It was a very, a very critical uh, debate, including in the secret meetings at the parliament. Denmark had a royal connection, we learned yesterday. And we learned also yesterday about pre-existing relations with an interest in Greece, which I found really interesting. And there were similar interests and relations in Norway and Sweden. Sweden had a significant Greek population, but in the case of um, for this specific question of how to react to Greece, it was much more important that Sweden had a very um, very large organizational landscape with many different organizations interested in international affairs, including the left wing or the rise of the new left, with activism targeting the United States and its involvement in the Vietnam War. It was also very important that Sweden had a social democratic government and that the social democrats were, very, of course, closely aligned with us and interwoven with the trade unions. So, what was so particular about this activism in Sweden was the early mobilization of the trade unions and the student movements. And the closeness of this activism with the government structures because people had positions both within trade unions or within the student movements and within the party and at the parliament or local governments. So, the, the, the distance from activism to the government was short, it was almost non-existent. And most importantly was the role of some very important persons and the rise of Amnesty International with Hans Jörn Frank, who was a communist at the time, later became a social democrat. 
And he was leader of the Swedish Committee for Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, and he was also the first chairman of Amnesty International in Sweden. He also had a Nordic a Scandinavian network. So the early establishment of these national committees for Greece, which we know happened in many countries, were formed in the Scandinavian regions largely because of these Amnesty International initiatives and Hans Jürgen Frank playing a very significant role. Sweden, of course, was the uh, state where um, Amnesty grew very quickly and became one of the largest national sections of Amnesty in the 60s. So when uh, I noticed uh, James Beckett yesterday saying that these committees uh, sprung up, I think that we need to recognize the instrumental work of these activists in forming these cross-party uh, committees, uh, and that it happened very quickly. And that they helped with organizing activities. A very important activity in uh, Norway was the committee, uh, the uh, delegation trip to uh, Athens, the Nordic delegation trip to Athens in August. So when the Swedish foreign minister notes that there has been so much public pressure, we need to do something, we will, we will apply to the European Council regardless of what you guys are doing. Uh, this pressure must be understood, I think, towards this uh, background. The European uh, Council had, as you all know, uh, earlier in June decided or, or, or uh, wanted, uh, encouraged their members to do this, and that provided the legitimacy that the Nordics needed at the crucial point. Because they said, we have been, uh, we have been encouraged to do it, and now we are doing it. When the decision to file the application was made, the Scandinavian government then poured resources into it and really followed it through to conclusion, as we also learned yesterday. So the Greek case became a very significant development if you speak of it as part of human rights history in the Scandinavian region. Because before that, the Scandinavian regions had had a very touchy and reactive interest in human rights. They have been part of international negotiations. There are signs that they have been become more interested. Um, Sweden and Norway have just <coughs> accepted the uh, European Court of Human Rights. 1964 for Norway, 1966 for Sweden. They have participated in making the, um, the uh, Convention Against Racism. Uh, the two covenants have been completed in the UN. But in none of these processes where they much of a forward leaning. Uh, but after the Greek case, human rights became part of this active pol foreign policy of Sweden, the engagement policy, as it is called in Norway. Even though it would take longer before they really uh, put an emphasis on uh, human rights. But it became a process where they expected that they would have an international role on human rights issues. After uh, after the Greek case, yeah, you're closer, closer. Uh, closer. Right. Yes. after the Greek case in Europe, Sweden became the leading protagonist in anti-torture politics at the United Nations. Uh, as I mentioned, Sweden, like neighboring states, had a tendency to consult uh, its Nordic counterparts on major initiatives in environmental settings. Uh, that is something uh, a crucial factor in the Greek case in the first place. Uh, to this, I want to add that following the case and uh, at the UN and perhaps the Human Rights Commission, <coughs> torture in particular, uh, the informal uh, networks uh, that is directly between foreign ministries and delegations became very important. Yeah. And another issue uh, was increased, and that is that Sweden had a tendency to treat the Netherlands as something. Uh, like an ordinary Nordic state, as far as cooperation and uh, consultations went. 
this is an important backdrop in understanding not only anti-torture politics at the UN in the 1970s and 80s in general, but the establishment of the UN Declaration and Convention Against Torture in particular. Why Sweden? Much has been written about AI's uh, international campaign for the abolition of torture. Uh, here, uh, and Sweden was, was indeed influenced by Amnesty, but there is an outlier. More important than the international campaign uh, seems to be the activities of the national section, which also played a part in the, in the Greek case. Uh, in early, you know, the fall of, uh, around August 1972, uh, Amnesty in Sweden began lobbying uh, the Swedish Foreign Ministry direct, directly by way of letters, uh, and there, if, for specifically uh, the making of a convention, and their efforts uh, culminated uh, in January. Uh, 1973, uh, with two members of parliament, Nils Jok and Evert Svensson, uh, for the Social Democrats, then in power, uh, on the of Palma, who, who raised an issue in Ikstagen. Uh, it, it was a resolution that resolved that the foreign ministry in Sweden <coughs> should do whatever it could uh, to put the human rights issue of torture in what manner they so self choose. Uh, choose uh, in, I think the wording was in the, in, in the intergovern appropriate intergovernmental setting. <coughs> From this point on, Sweden was tentatively committed. They had no idea, however, how to proceed. Uh, and one point about this is that January 1973 is exceedingly early. The international campaign had merely started, and it's more than six months before the much written about one million signatures, for instance, delivered to the UN and, and other initiatives. Throughout 1973, uh, Sweden discussed raising, but first of all, the form of what it should take. Should it be an initiative for a convention immediately, like Amnesty wanted? Should it go by way of a declaration? Or several other initiatives Amnesty wanted? They discussed briefly doing this in the Scandinavian uh, joint initiative, but this, for various reasons, was postponed uh, until 1974. But it's decided to come back to it the following year. Instead, Sweden acted on their own in what became the resolution in 1973, condemning torture and resolving to return to these uh, at a later <coughs> This set uh, the ball rolling, as it were, but uh, annual resolutions on the torture issue at the UN um, continuously up until the adoption of the convention, albeit 1976, sort of, it was a slow year. With the declaration, uh, to go by way of declaration, that is the customary first step to a human rights convention at the UN, it was not decided. A plan was developed, it was early 1975, by uh, a very small circle of Swedish and Dutch diplomats together. Uh, the primary protagonists were uh, Van Boom, the Netherlands, and Hans Danielius, leader of the, um, uh, 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 yeah, leader of the division dealing with. Uh, Humor as the same division that had, had uh, worked on the Greek case, in fact, in Sweden. Uh, their plan consisted mainly of using um, a mandate secured by the Dutch the year before uh, to discuss the torture issue at a crime congress and report there onto the General Assembly. The, the immediate advantage of this plan was to avoid the Commission on Human Rights, a dreaded commission that, uh, for its inefficiency. It also meant that. The plan was developed in secret and in a small circle. Uh, complete secrecy, in fact, was uh, it started as for Sweden, uh, insisted as per usual to involve Nordic countries, at least brief them. This meant that the applicant state of the Greek case had a chance before any other state in the world to not only purview but also comment upon the Swedish draft for declaration against torture. Uh, the initiative later was uh, later put forth at uh, the crime at the Crown Congress in September. And this is a, a very short period for a, for a human rights uh, declaration compared well, compared to some others. Between the time the, the, the initiative was revealed to the larger community of nations in September, and the declaration itself was adopted at the UN something like three months had gone by. Uh, yeah, moving along, we should perhaps I should just quickly summarize uh, the initiative uh, 
to, to actually launch Icon Mansion, which followed uh, not the following year, but, but in 1977. I think we might say that on, on the initiative, Sweden and, and uh, the Netherlands parted ways. It had to do with various things. Uh, Van Boven himself uh, highlighted in his communications to the Swedes that uh, he had met a lot of resistance from the Ministry of Justice. And we see a very different constellation between uh, the dynamics between the Ministry of Justice and the Foreign Ministry in the Netherlands and in Sweden. Uh, in Sweden, the diplomats were in charge and uh, only consulted the Ministry when absolutely necessary. The initiative then became a, a Swedish affair. The, the, also the initiative to start work on a convention against torture at the UN. And there, in fact, our paper ends. But, but, but I can briefly say that following this initiative, there was years, uh, years of, um, of uh, discussions at the, at the commission that it was not possible to avoid the commission in, uh, on a convention. Uh, and Sweden and Denmark uh, and other Nordic states played a part of various processes in, in, in the commission and uh, most notably in a Nordic lobby, lobby effort to secure the adoption of the commission. So if I, if I should try and wrap up very quickly, I, I, I just, we, we might say that given all these initiatives by the applicant state in the UN case <laughs> and their interactions at the UN after the case, uh, perhaps one of the most important implications of the case is its effect on Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark and Norway. Namely that it first introduced these states to the human rights issue of torture and set the precedence for an active approachment to this issue in the foreign policy. Thank you. for a Greek public from what we heard is that uh, the Greek case, I mean in, in Greece we look at it as a story related to the fight against the dictatorship but uh, the Greek case for the Scandinavian countries and we will hear probably now in the Netherlands too uh, started a process uh, which is broader than the Greek case and it has to do with uh, the issues of torture, human rights in international forum. The next speaker uh, is from the Netherlands, it's uh, Lieve Holmes, uh, PhD candidate at the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he combines in his research historical and uh, legal approaches. Uh, he has he focuses on the European Convention of Human Rights and its reception in the Netherlands. Uh, his, the subject of his paper will be the Greek case, because in the Netherlands as a watershed moment for engagement with uh, European human rights. I'll move up the Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Um, let's see so many of you could make it uh, this early in the morning, um, even with notes uh, from the hotel. Uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, I am a historian and a lawyer by training, which uh, makes the Greek case very interesting to approach from both the historical as well as the legal side. Um, I will get you very, in very broad senses through the Dutch engagement with the Greek case. And usually the Dutch engagement with the Greek case is summarized in one person really, uh, Max van der Stoel. He will not 
functioning very prominently in my talk. I apologize for that. But his actions were really the actions of Max van der Stoel and maybe not so, so much of the Netherlands. Now, I will guide you through the talk with the help of a PowerPoint. It's very old fashioned, maybe, but I thought it would be helpful to get some ideas of what we're going to do. There will be some pictures, they will be in Dutch, but no worry, I'll translate as soon as they pop up. What I want to do is talk mainly about three points, and that is the why of the filing of the complaint by the Dutch in the case of the Greek case, uh, and show that while there was a reluctant government, uh, activism made a huge impact and ties into the previous paper as well. So we need to look at these committees and see their impact. Secondly, I would like to tell a bit uh, about how, how this went on in practice behind the scenes, the coordination with the Scandinavian countries, the rejection ultimately of a friendly settlement, which was actually much promoted by the Commission and other states within the Council of Europe, um, and also show how the Netherlands in this process tied itself to the Convention. Finally, if we have time, I would briefly like to speak about the implications of this Greek case for the Dutch engagement with the Convention, more specifically uh, the closing down of certain policy options with regards to the Convention, as well as opening up windows of opportunity for activists and ac academics dealing with European human rights. Great. So that's what we're going to do. First step. The why. Why join an interstate complaint in the first notion? Now, it is important to know that the initial position of the government of the Netherlands was very reluctant in these settings. Um, to file an interstate complaint is basically a diplomatic insult. And when the coup uh, took place, there was no movement in the Dutch government whatsoever. What, what, to, the orientation political? Hmm? what was the political orientation of the government? Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So keep your question. I will address this slightly later on in the presentation. I even have a picture of the person we're going to talk about. So moving, it was considered to be a diplomatic insult, mostly, to file this interstate campaign. Yet, on the background, certain things were moving in the Dutch political order. And these are two very broad developments I'd like to touch upon very briefly, which are issues of decolonization and a change in the remembrance of the Second World War. Now, very briefly, in 1962, uh, the Netherlands lost New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, which was the final remnant of the empire in the eastern part of the world. And usually the, the critique which could be expected if criticism of other member states in terms of human rights was uh, at hand was a counter, well, you're a colonial empire. You have not even extended a convention to New Guinea, which indeed the Netherlands hadn't. With the loss of New Guinea, however, there emerged a new sense of moral duty. So to show it was being sincere in its decolonization efforts, a new attempt to be morally credible. And you see from the loss of New Guinea onwards a new sense of activism, particularly in the United Nations, um, where the Netherlands embraced the uh, United Nations uh, treaties. Uh, so there's a slightly new moral appeal to, uh, to Dutch foreign policy. Second, the change in remembrance of the Second World War. This is a very tricky topic. I think we will discuss this a bit further, maybe tomorrow, when we talk about trauma and memory culture. Um, in the mid-60s, uh, the image of the Netherlands as being an innocent country, collectively harmed by the German Nazi invasion, and basically everyone was a hero, was in the resistance, shifts. 
uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, 61, but also very strong uh, sources in the Dutch public debate say, well, this is a too innocent image. Basically, we were quite complicit in, in particular, the destruction of the Dutch, Dutch Jewry, um, the Jewish communities. And we can see this being translated into the new, in a new kind of activism, never again. And also, we need to prevent Nazism, fascism, rising again. Really, it is something from the 60s. And we can see it in how new actors, and this is where we get to the activism part, um, react to the Greek case. From Quite early on, the military junta is um, labeled fascist and the new Nazis. The prisoner islands are being dubbed concentration camps. This is a, a flyer from 71, I think, calling for action and the link to the Nazi us is quite clear. What's more, this, these action groups use a new language, the language of human rights. Human rights, um, not necessarily that much used in the 50s in terms of foreign policy solidarity, emerge in this international solidarity movement as a universalist appeal which could transcend uh, old party or old political divisions. One committee in particular stands out in this action group. That is the committee. Free Greece Comité Vrij Griekenland, as we would say in Dutch, and it is a committee which reflects like much like the trade unions, a very close connection between activism, government, and academia. Politicians of um, a variety of <coughs> political backgrounds come together in this committee. We have social democrats, we have liberals, uh, Christian democrats. But most importantly, the committee contains experts, legal experts. And it is the legal experts that matter. You can see one of them in the picture, a young professor of international law in Utrecht. And to them, the Greek coup d'etat is not just a violation of democracy. It is a violation of the convention. It is via their insights that what can we do? Well, we have this very obscure international law document, never used before in our policy, which we might use in this regard. And the, the man in the picture, Professor Captain, sees it also as having a legal duty on the government to interfere. And this, via the input of these lawyers, they transcend their ideas to the politicians, which they meet in this committee. And Max von der Stuhl is, 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 is involved. Um, Parliament, the politicians, enact motions to uh, ask the Dutch government to join the complaint, file a complaint of the Scandinavians against the Greeks. Secondly, to file a complaint offers a very neat middle ground between doing nothing at all and kicking Greece out of NATO, which was the more extreme version. So it's, it's a middle ground proposed by the lawyers in this committee, then taken up by politicians and accepted in subsequent motions in Parliament. This leads to a reluctant complaint. This man is, which I referred to earlier, we would talk about him. This is Josef Lunds, diehard conservative uh, and Minister of Foreign Affairs very influential figure in the uh, period, almost single-handedly shaped the Dutch foreign policy, and he uh, feels nothing to file a complaint. He uh, doesn't want to do it, basically. Very oriented on the Atlantic, very NATO-friendly, he to become Secretary General of NATO. But he is being confronted with these motions from Parliament and has to do something. Now, this is not a complaint by the Dutch government out of the kindness of their hearts, by no means. For Lunds, it's a way to get its hands free from the constant pressure of Parliament. But 
pointing to the investigation of the Commission, which was expected to last several years. The Dutch government had its hands free to entail in diplomacy, backdoor diplomacy, with Greece, whilst saying to Parliament, well, this is under investigation, there's nothing we can do. So basically, the complaint offers room for political maneuver for the Dutch government. Um, it has been coordinated beforehand in the Benelux, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands. Okay, we will join in the complaint with the Scandinavians, but we will be very reluctant while doing so. This reluctance shapes the Dutch engagement with the Greek case also behind the scenes in its legal coordination with the Scandinavians. This is where we get to the how, the legal politics in action. So then they join in the complaint, then what? And it's important to remember how this reluctance also plays out in the Dutch engagement in the complaint itself. From the beginning, the aim of the Dutch government in filing the complaint is moving towards a friendly settlement. There is no interest in getting uh, a conviction of Greece. It's, it's aimed to be a return to democracy. It will give you some years and in the end, hopefully, you'll make some amends. Scandinavians, the, the Nordics, Scandinavian sounds a bit derogative, uh, the Nordic countries are, in that sense, much more strict and firm, pushing for active investigation, pushing for um, true engagement from the Commission with the Convention, firmly pressing also notions of torture, investigating issues of torture, filing an additional complaint because of a violation of the Convention because of torture. The Dutch government does not go with the additional complaint of torture. It uh, leaves that to the Scandinavian parties, thinking that it's too much of a hassle to prove anyway, um, and not for them to take up. This is something the Scandinavians will do. They will not join in the additional torture complaint. But then why, ultimately, did the Dutch reject the friendly settlement when it was proposed by the Commission and other member states of the Council of Europe? It had to do with how the Dutch, while the process was ongoing, tied itself to the Convention. The longer the case progressed, the more it became uh, a legal dispute rather than a purely political dispute. When the Commission um, went to the Nordics and the Netherlands, go well, we want to go for a friendly settlement. The Scandinavians flat out rejected. Um, the only issue, way the uh, friendly settlement could be achieved is by the removal of the junta and return of parliamentary democracy. It was basically the Scandinavian answer. Now, for the Dutch then, it was very difficult to take an alternative route and actually accepting for its position a friendly settlement. It had been going with the Scandinavian position for a number of years now and it would be political, politically unfeasible if they would suddenly break ranks with the Scandinavians and accept a friendly settlement <coughs> even though it had been its initial aim. Secondly, this was where I alluded to earlier, it is, was no longer purely a political backdoor conflict. The conflict had been legalized to an extent. The Commission had found violations of the Convention. Um, and it became increasingly difficult to uphold that it was merely an attempt to return to democracy if there was so much overwhelming evidence that, in fact, the Convention, which it was actively engaging, had been violated. This brings me to a slight second point on how this also engaged with the changing thinking of the Dutch in what the convention meant. And what the Greek case also shows is the divergent understandings of what this convention means. To the Greeks, Greek colonels, the choice was very clear. The colonels or the communists. 
Uh, this is a wonderful piece of propaganda uh, on the left from the Greek government that the Greek state was being undermined by communism. Now, this was a political argument, but it was also a slightly legal argument. The convention initially had been set up to protect Western Europe from communist threats. It was a value judgment against communism. Um, previous cases of the Communist Party in Germany have been accepted as well. You can obviously prohibit the Communist Party. It was also a slightly legal argument. Now, for the Netherlands, this case reflects and warn me how, many, how much time I still have. Um, perfect. For the Netherlands, this was a slightly different thing. The Greek case forced it to reflect upon what the convention meant. And as you can see quite clearly here, this was not about European unity, not about anti-communist values. No, it was about the rights of individual men underlined in this document. And that was a, a choice to be made. You could make the, uh, this was about European values, etc., etc., etc. But in the legal proceedings, it was clearly held, it was about the rights of individual men um, substantiating that position quite firmly for the future. Final two minutes, fairly briefly, please ask in the discussion, if you have any questions on the last slide, what are the implications? You can see this, I would say, as a boomerang effect of this external action taken from Catherine Sicking, so uh, sociologist saying if you use human rights in foreign policy, it will ultimately end up in your domestic setting as well. Very briefly, using the Greek case closed down certain policy options. Simultaneously, Belgium asked for Dutch help in revising the system of the convention in the context of a different case under the convention, the Belgian linguistics case, where well, Belgium was being pulled in front of the European Court of Human Rights and was probably going to, um, to, to find a violation of the convention. Belgium was furious, tried to alter the convention. Dutch said, no, we are now so engaged in the convention, there's so much public attention, we will not help you in doing this. Clear example of the Greek case being used to prevent political action in terms of shaping or uh, changing the image. Secondly, it opened up windows of opportunity. Max von der Stuhl, I have to mention him once, um, later on uh, very influential in the foreign policy minister, firmly pushed for a more active engagement with the convention. For academics, it was a first meeting with the convention previously an oasis in international law, now much more known. Legal journals first, talk to, first mentioned the convention in context of the Greek case as being a viable human rights document. And finally, the action, solidarity with the, with the third world, with Greece, very foreign oriented, moves inward. The same people involved in the Committee Free Greece also happened to be lawyers in Amsterdam, <coughs> which then started using the convention also in domestic legal context. So you can see how it's usually the, precisely those people who act in solidarity elsewhere trying to use the same document they've used so successfully in foreign policy in its domestic legal order, where the convention so turns out to become something of a solution for domestic legal solutions rather than just a foreign policy document. Slightly over time, I think. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, I think uh, this presentation uh, illustrates what would have already been a theme, and I guess will be also in the next presentations. Uh, namely that uh, the action of the states, the applicant states uh, in the Greek case, was of course uh, guided by a number of factors which are not related uh, to solidarity with Greece. Uh, of course, that in no way uh, invalidates uh, the value that uh, the whole of this case had for the anti-dictatorial struggle uh, here. 
but it is interesting to see this 